You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. You know, it's so funny because like I literally had the dumbest thing happen to me like three weeks ago. So the boat I have, it has a plug and it has a little piece that goes into the hole. I know, I know I'm going to get this meme to death, but anyway, but it just hangs there when you're not using it and then mm-hmm. you screw it in and whatever. Well, I've had this plug for the boat for 20 years, I, as, as long as I've owned the boat. And the other day, de- like three weeks ago, I get down at the river, I unscrew it, it hangs there, I drive home, I go to clean the boat off and I look and the plug is gone. It mm-hmm. literally must have just dry rotted and fell out. And guess yeah. what? It's like a specialty order item because the boat is so old. Because guess what? Everything nowadays is, feels like it's specialty order. Can, can you get it? Uh, I finally did, but it was, again, it wasn't like a cheap part. Mm-hmm. That's what's so annoying. Like It's not a normal size plug? No, because they were like, we could do a normal size plug, or we could make it a specialty plug, and then we could charge out the butt for it. Yeah. Well, you're lucky they still have them. Yeah, I'm really lucky. They Are you going to buy more them. than one? Oh, God, yeah, I bought two. <laughs> I'm not that stupid. I got two just in yeah, case it happens again to be the guy that doesn't have a plug in his boat. So Jeff, these batteries, hey, these batteries lasted me six months and now they're starting to, they're starting to leak. So uh, what you're saying is this is not the brand you're going to go with next time? No, it's the same, same brand I'm going to go with. It's Walmart because they're cheap. This has been brought to you by Walmart. <laughs> and uh, what are they called? Everstart? I mean, they That's work not- until they don't. You know what I mean? <laughs> that would be a great brand name. They work until they don't. <laughs> they work until they don't. And um, I, I imagine the warranty um, is a year warranty. I, I would imagine they'd uh, honor that, knowing that when I bring it in there, they'll see that it's leaking acid. Dude, it's... But again, like, would you spend the money for a lithium? Do you know what I mean? No. What? I said, think about it with lithium now. Like, w- would you spend the money for lithium? Yeah, if they were... Um, if if I knew for 100% that you could charge them when the, when the temperature is really cold in the teens and the twenties and stuff and not have an issue. Cause apparently it, um, they don't do well under freezing temperatures. Really? Is that, is that true? Uh, They're rated for 32 degrees and above. This is, feels like it's my, my like, like hit word right now is allegedly. So is alleged- it, it, I mean, is, is this something we should be talking about? Yeah, I think it's something we should be talking about, but I'm not good with the math and the thinking, so I, I'm going to leave that to you. Like, chemistry-wise, apparently the batteries suck when it's when it's cold outside, but they work so well when when they work. Oh, yeah. I would have them then. Yeah, sure. But apparently, well, here's another problem. When you fish all the time, uh, what happens if one of them goes bad? What do That's I true. do? I have to switch back over to lead acid until the new battery gets sent to me because I can't just go to a Marine shop and buy new ones. Right. That is, that's actually a fascinating, and I, because I wouldn't go buy new ones cause they cost too much even individually. <sighs> you couldn't buy it. I mean, you, you wouldn't want to spend that money because it's under warranty and it should be replaced for free. But how long does that take? And the trolling motor, you can't fish without the trolling motor. You cannot fish without a trolling motor. That is, that is some facts. Have you seen, um, these trolling motors that they have on the back of the boats now? Yeah, I, I happened to see a picture. Um, is, is that what those little those little propellers are, or props? Yeah, I'll uh, let me see if I can get this up for you, boss. Because it's uh, I thought I, I had a good chuckle. I really did because it's like, how in the heck? Well, that kind it kind of looks dangerous, dude. It's just like you look like a military just predator drone. You got blades every which way. Let me pull this up for everybody so everyone can see it. Hey, for um, let everyone know for people that are. Uh, Um, thinking about fishing soon. I'm starting to show on the gauges that the water start is going to increase by the weekend. And then I looked at the weather and I don't see anything. I, I guess it's north. I guess I didn't look further far enough north. We're supposed to have a rise. Well, let's talk about the weather the past couple of weeks. I mean, right now we're sitting in, we're sitting in early May. Um, we're going into the heart of May right now. Are the fish in pre-spawn still, or are they actually going into spawn? They're in pre-spawn. They're going to start. I'm sure there's a few that have, there's a few go-getters, you know, that probably uh, can uh, 
walk the wire, so to speak, and and be successful with their spawn, right? I mean, some of them have been out there for many, many years and know the drill. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, it's just today it's 62 degrees right now, and um, it hasn't been – what the heck's going on with this thing? It hasn't been um, – Let's see here. Yeah, it hasn't been 60 degrees consistently for uh, quite some time. It gets up to 16 and it drops out. And it got real cold. The water got into the mid to low 50s um, just not even a week ago. Wow. On the Susquehanna, the water was registering 51 degrees. You know, that boggles the mind that it's May and the water temperatures are that degree. Like, did you know, you probably already know this, but like a week ago at Deep Creek Lake, it was snowing. No, I didn't know that. At Deep Creek Lake. I don't, I, I don't, I don't, um, I'm not surprised. That's a whole other climate up there. Yeah. And it's not so far away from us though. And it's like the same thing with the Susquehanna. It's not far away, but just the idea that you could still have pre-spawn water temperatures is fascinating to me. Yeah. I mean, the water hasn't, what's it? 60 to 65 degrees are supposed to spawn in, mm-hmm. but I don't think they're going to spawn if the water keeps dropping down to 53, 54, back up to 58. It doesn't work that way. Once it well, gets up to a certain temperature, it has to hold there for probably, you know, a week, week and a half, two weeks. And then they might start um, doing that. Oh, I a hundred percent agree with that. I mean, I mean, w- w- with that said, there's, what a lot have of, you been- there, there, there's a lot of people out there though, that will uh, disagree with that, but. I mean, it is a hot take. Like it has to be because I, I think I think once a fish commits to spawn, they're going to spawn no matter what, though. Yeah, they have to. I would I would imagine, right? Oh, 100 percent. Um, and with but that I mean, said, they, they can't survive if the water temperature isn't right for them. You know, the the babies that is the 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 eggs, right? What's the latest you've seen fish spawn? Well, the generic time is between May first and June fifteenth. June fifteenth. If you ask, uh, um, if you ask someone that has something to do with, uh, you know, um, the Department of Natural Resource, I believe that's the time frame that they would give you. Generic. What's the la- What's the latest that you've seen? All the way into early June. Oh wow! Because that's crazy. it just depends on the um, the year and the uh, weather. You know. What about this year? Like, what are you seeing right now with the fish movements? So uh, a few years, a uh, few years. Yes. Cause it's been years since I've talked to you a few, a few weeks ago when, when you were on here earlier and we talked about the fish movement, how have they changed? What have you seen on the water since then? Well, there, um, I've seen them. Um, they're in areas, uh, where, where they're kind of like territorial. You'll see them and, and, um, you know, in eddies, and they'll swim off, but they'll come back. You'll see it on the Susquehanna too. Um, really, and they're 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 holding in certain areas, like they want to spawn. They just haven't yet. I think they're getting ready. And I, now, how much do you think the water? Now, this is just river. This is just for the. These are. This is just for these two rivers. I'm not saying this if someone's watching this and fishes Black Hills Lake or some type of well, reservoir. I don't know anything about that. If you guys clicked on a video or a podcast that says Upper Potomac River <laughs> Fishing Report, and you were like, wait a minute, this doesn't apply to Lake Anna. It's just like, come on. But you know, you're you're probably a voter too. So God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, right now the water's showing 62 degrees and uh and holding strong. And the water level, let's 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 see. I'm I'm looking at the point of rocks gauge. Uh, that's kind of it's just kind of a um, gives you a kind of a an idea. All of this stuff is you just take it with a grain of salt, right? No, I mean, but but it gets you like you said. It's a good grain of salt that actually gives you it right in the ballpark of what's going on. Yeah. Um, what the heck? Here, let's go to a different one because that one somehow I messed it up and now I can't get it to. <laughs> go back to its original uh reading so 62 degrees oh and um it's supposed to rise come showing wednesday it's supposed to rise 
And at Point of Rocks, it's supposed to go up to 6-1. Really? But that's just an estimate right now. Anytime, um, I don't know if people realize this, when they're looking at this graph, if the blue line, um, I'm looking at the uh, the NOAA graph. And so there's a blue line, and then there's a, a line that has purple dots on it. When the blue line and the purple dotted line actually are touching, that's what it believes is going to happen. But when those two lines separate on the graph, that means it's getting ready to um, adjust. And it's going to get in the next few hours, it's going to show you something completely different. Here you go. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to show it on the screen. You said it was, I think this is the right one here. I'll share this just because I think this is great information, what you're saying. And I want to make sure everyone can actually visualize it. So here you go. Cause I don't go. think people, um, sometimes, um, yeah, there it is. It's the same one I'm looking at. So yeah, just, uh, now that everyone can visually see it could say it again. So you see the blue line, the blue line yeah. is what, what's actually happening. Okay. That's real time. And then the, uh, purple dotted line to the right right now they're touching that's um mm. the gauge is pretty certain that that water is going to go that way and 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 in levels you know water levels but in the next few hours that could separate and when you see those two lines separate and you see white in between them you know you see the two the, are the white squares in the background if they yeah. separate and you got some um you've got um space in between that means the gauge is getting ready to adjust Oh, and it's going to show you something completely different. It's going to head either up or down or, you know, in a straight line or something like that. So does this mean, how do you interpret this with rain? So example is it, it, it's saying that that's a lot of rain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So does that mean when it's 6.1, does that mean the rain has already stopped? So let's say based on this. Yeah. That means that water crested. Okay. But but that's that's for future reference. If it's blue, if that if that six point one was still was a solid blue line, that's where it would have crested. And now it's okay. getting ready to fall. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So this is telling you, okay, so based on this, it's probably gonna rain between now and and Wednesday then somewhere. It could or it could start raining um somewhere in late Wednesday afternoon or evening. Or it could be raining right now up further up north in the um, watershed of the Potomac River somewhere. Do you I haven't know? Looked at the weather. I haven't looked at the weather in, um, uh, in Cumberland. Do you know the average depth in the springtime or the right flow that you usually see this time of year? Yeah, the average, average depth. Which one is this? Is this the... Um, the average depth, my my guesstimate would be, is somewhere between three and four feet at the point of rocks gauge. That still gives you quite a bit of quite a bit of water. So with you can, the you can look at the history. Go down a little bit more. Scroll down. Does it does it allow you to look at history on this one? Historical. Historical oh, crests? crests. Those are those are crests. Those are those are um, low water. Look at that. Zero that point. In. But what t what time of year was that? Nineteen sixty six. Oh man! Look at, look at the low water. Yeah, that's the that's the record. That's Ever insane. since they've been keeping water. I mean, I don't even know how much water would actually be in the river at Point of Rocks with that. That's a, that's a lot of water or that, that, that is a lack of a lot of water. That's insane. Wow. Like you could walk across the river at that point. Oh, easy. And then you flip that out with this here, which is the recent crest. You got 18 feet in 2022, May of last year. Mm -hmm. And honestly, this is so interesting because we talk about the smallmouth spawn so much on this channel. Um, and mm -hmm. you look at, all these high water events. Look at how recent they are. Look you know, at 18. Had, look how bad yeah. 18 was. That's why it hurt um, uh, the Potomac River. You see that? Yeah. They can withstand one here and one there. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Those are th th those have nothing to do. Th those are in September and, um, and December. 
I thought, Winger, I thought those were relating to um, April. No, no, we got them right here. So, so last year, 2022, we had one in May. And that's then, a lot of water, man. 18 feet. Look at, but look at 2018 though, just in general, look at how many happened in 2018. You have one, two, three, four, five high water events. The, the average water level or the lowest, I should say the lowest, the water ever got in 2018 from, from the very beginning of 2018 till the end. Um, at the Ed, I can remember this at the Edwards ferry gauge. It never went below five feet the entire year. Really? The normal water level at Edwards ferry would would read somewhere around three and a half feet in the summer. I mean, that's why you have bad spawn classes right there. Well, and that's why the grass hasn't grown in um, completely like it did in 2017 and 16. And yeah, that's the only re um, is that the only well water event they had in 2016? Just one 2014. Same thing. Yeah. You see, look at 2003. Look Holy shit. That was bad. That was real bad. It's almost like, look at this, 1998. It, it does. It goes in cycles, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Wait, are you saying weather has patterns? Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. But no, that's nuts. And then you go down, just, hey, go down some more. 96, you'll see some crazy. You'll see a crazy number. 36 feet. Look at that. See that? Jesus. That's one of the uh, biggest floods ever recorded. On the okay. Potomac River. I can't visualize. Is that does that mean Harper's Ferry is flooded at 36 feet? Right? I don't know, man. I, I know that that water, 36 feet, it's all the way in Point of Rocks in town on the main on main uh, near Main Street. My God. Really? Yeah. They have a monument there in Point of Rocks. That shows you all the high water events that they've recorded in the last hundred years, like the the uh, the really significant ones. So this is Point of Rocks right here. So you're saying this right here was covered? That's insane. Yeah, the town the, the town would have been covered. I mean, it would have been there would have been water on on the, on what they call what what's Main Street, which is uh, I forget the name of it, but they don't call right it Main here. Street. But yeah, but it's Main Street. So the railroad, the railroad is completely flooded. Yeah. That's a mean flood right there. Dude, that is a really mean flood. That's insane. Um, wow. Oh, it put, um, at 36 feet, it puts, uh, uh, the, um, it puts the building at White's Ferry almost completely underwater. All you see is the roof sticking up. We're going to. You see that building there? Is that, yeah, zoom, keep zooming down. Maybe it'll show the building. You can get an idea. Right here. No, there's the building right there. Uh, it's below it. Keep zooming in. See it right there? Yeah. That entire building was underwater. And those, and those, uh, those are apartments over there that you just pointed at first. Oh, really? Those were, that, that was housing for the um, ferry, uh, uh, operators have you ever used this boat ramp before yeah is it it's terrible are you, is it terrible yeah they, it's cost ten dollars right now at least uh, mm. the last time i checked to put your boat in there and it's it's probably the worst boat ramp from seneca creek all the way up um to lander but i was just thinking like where else in this area, like how far of a run is it from Seneca Creek up to White's Ferry? Um, Give or take. 10 miles. Okay. Dude, that's nuts. I just, I just feel like this stretch just does not get hit very much anymore. And, uh, the, uh, and White's Ferry, uh, yeah, I mean, they're still not in operation yet. No, which means that whole part of the river is probably really chill right now. Yeah. That's, dude, that is absolutely insane. So, I mean, so for the people at home, what has the fishing been like right now? 
it's starting to um, pick up pretty good on the Potomac River. But the uh, the Susquehanna's fishing like it usually does. It fishes pretty good. Really, in the spring, yeah. How, how many uh, how many trips are you taking out of the Susquehanna right now? I've taken a um, handful. Most of my trips are on the Potomac. I've taken a handful out this year, but that doesn't mean I'm only up there. Ham. I mean, I'm up there um, even when I don't have trips. Like if I don't have a trip uh, during the week on the Potomac, sometimes I'll go. I'll go up to the uh, Susquehanna. Oh, and really? Just fish it. Yeah. Lucky. I'll go to the go to places and just see how it see how it's fishing for me, and um, you know, see what's going on, and then um, the next day I'll have a trip on the Potomac. So you do fun fish? Well, I'm not, yeah. I mean, I'm up there. Um, I enjoy doing it, but I'm I'm, I'm looking. <laughs> I'm looking for stuff. Looking for fish. Maybe maybe there's fish in a spot that I didn't um, catch them in last year, you know? How much are the fish moving right now compared to, let, let's say, like the last time you were on, it was like late March, early April. It was cold, snowy, rainy. Now a lot of people are in shorts and a t-shirt and people are feeling like, hey, listen, this is, you know, prime floating weather for to getting on the river. But the river's still in a lot of flux. Yeah, I mean they're um I mean they're you know you you'll find them just all up and down the river in certain concentrations and and areas. I mean they some fish have moved miles to get to where they are. Mm. To enjoy the the Super Bowl of uh of their life which is the spawn. Are, are there certain spawning flats not to give them away or anything like that, but are there certain spawning flats on the river that they try to migrate to? Yeah. They'll always be there. Yeah. Really? Because mm -hmm. that was my next question is like, are they kind of like, um, oh God, what is that damn fish that we eat? That, that salmon? swim upstream? Thank you. <laughs> God, it feels I like. I mean, hey, you know, you know uh, it's funny because a small mouth is like a crappie. It's like a trout and it's like a salmon. It, um, it's finesse like a crappie. It, likes the cold it it enjoys colder water um you can find them in eddies in cold water you know during the winter like you can trout and they move like salmon they'll move up through um real, real rough water up through parts where um you really can't run a, a boat through maybe a raft but not a boat that that They're really fish that really is interesting to me the fact that why you have to protect smallmouth spawning bays because let's say you're out there you just bought a jet boat and you see a couple of smallmouth spawning and you drop a waypoint in theory that spot will have spawning smallmouth on it every year once you find out where they're doing the deed mm -hmm. um because they're genetically programmed and that makes it very <sighs> danger is not the right word but it would make it hard for them to reproduce well, if it's for, always very specific places for being such a tough fish and powerful fish and just all around fun fish to catch. They're very vulnerable. You know? They just are. Because they need that clean water. And, and any any fishery that has a, a really good, healthy population of smallmouth, it's a clean fishery. It's It's got decent water quality. They can't live in just sewage. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, they can't live in a pond, a farm pond like a, um, like some fish can. And just thrive True. in it. True. You just can't do that. What are you looking for generically in a spawning flat? And I was thinking what we could use is the Shenandoah. Since you're not on the Shenandoah and just kind of look at a map and kind of break that down. So people then know how to yeah, apply that. Ahead, any yeah, pull something up. Because I think that'd be that'd be good for the people at home to see. Do, 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 do. So, I will oh. tell you, um, we were talking about possible baits yes you want to get in that first or just while you're doing that just just uh, yeah. I'll, I'll give one and i i think it's uh, um it's a uh, it's just an absolutely awesome bait and it's a 365 type bait i it'll work in the winter time it'll work anytime it's that z-man tickler have you heard of it no do you have one yeah yeah, yeah. i i, yeah, I sell them here i'll show you give show my This is the good thing about this show, gentlemen. We are well organized and ready to go. That's how I kind of like to run my ship. 
crazy and hectic. But that's just what I do. Because I am right here trying to get Navionics up. Because I'm a genius. Here, it's, it's these right uh, here. All right, let me get let me get you full, let me get you a full screen here, big dog. There you go for your full screen. And this is this is a this this has been a popular color so far this year. It's called Houdini. Can you see that? Okay. Huh. Yeah, it's coming through great. Yeah, and here, let's let's open it up. I mean, they look like a Ned rig, but here's the here's a little kicker to them. See the little legs on them? What do they yeah. also look like? It looks like a tube. Yeah, like a tube. But it's you know it's it's got a longer body on it, and it's got legs on it, legs whatever you want to call it. That thing is neat. And uh, so it's like a, it's like a solid tube, then, isn't it? Yeah, two and three quarter inch. Um, it's a two and three quarter inch bait. How do you like to rig it? I rig it with a. Uh, I think I have one in here on my boat, just chilling out somewhere. Guys, we're only giving you the best stuff. This is the stuff he quite oh, literally... Here it is. Here it is. Oh, hold on. It's embarrassing. I got some I got some lines still on the on the jig head. But the uh bullet jig head. The Z-Man bullet jig head. Oh wow. Just like that. Rig it with a uh, um rig it weedless. Yeah, everyone calls it weedless, but so it doesn't get snagged on the bottom of the river as much. Or use the uh, finesse shroom heads they have. And um, most of the time I'm fishing with a one-tenth ounce if you're talking uh, Z-Man. Okay, but to be real, is the shroom head, is it actually weedless? No, the shroom head isn't, but these are. These are, these are pretty darn um, reliable. And rocks and stuff. And how heavy is it? That's a one tenth ounce. One tenth. It's, so it's 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 like um one eighth. It's their one eighth version. And one tenth would be a little bit lighter than an eighth. You're killing my brain right now. So I'm just gonna write it down. That's a lot of math right there. <laughs> For me. <laughs> <laughs> oh dude, that's perfect. Cause yeah, because like I've I've always I want to try that bait. Um you're kind of selling me on it. It's it's an excellent bait, man. The other it's, one that I, th I think you sold me on is that baby Ned head too. That Ned rig as well. Oh, the Ned rig, the two and three quarter inch, just a straight up uh, Ned bait. Yeah, the boring, the boring old Ned. Yeah, I had right, someone I send me a. Um, I had someone send me a um, a message recently, and uh, he said he was doing real well with them. Really. Yeah, the Neds. Yeah. He said in an hour he caught a dozen or more in one hour. It's pretty darn good. Well, yeah, and I don't think you know this. So I basically live on the Conica Jig, which dumps in to the upper Potomac at Williamsport. Uh-huh. So that's where I'm at. And I can wade fish there literally from my house. And so I'll go there and I'll start and I'll, and I'll just catch some smallmouth and stuff. Cause it's loaded with nice ones, like it, up to like two pounds. Oh, and yeah. I, tr I tried to wade fish there the other day and I didn't realize that guess what? It's still effing cold. Um, so I'm wading through there. I slip. So I drop my transmission into the water. I'm freezing to death, but otherwise get to the other side of this Creek, throw the net rig out there. Boom. I catch a three and a half pound smallmouth out of a Creek. That's no wider than a baseball diamond. What um, um oh, what, what were you using? Uh, a micro Ned rig, those tiny ones. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna try those. But it, it was so crazy because I caught that. I caught a rock bass, a sucker. It's like it's just it's a little bit smaller, so it lets you catch anything that swims, basically. Mm -hmm. But you don't catch the big ones necessarily. I think that tickler you were showing off though might be the ticket for the big ones. I mean, that, that thing's that, that's a cool bait. I, I mean, I know. I know it looks like everything under the sun, a tube, a Ned rig, a, you know, any other plastic bait you can think of. But for whatever reason, they, they can on it. So that's the uh, that's the bait. That would be my uh, bait of choice if I'm throwing plastics. And guys, as always, link in the episode description um, to, to, to Mr. Green's store so he can so you can be able to purchase that 
along with the colors and also his website so you can uh, book a trip with him. And so now what we're going to do is I'm going to bring this map up right here. Ba Boom. Here we are. So we are on the Shenandoah River. Uh, we give you guys an idea. This is seven. It comes through to Winchester right here. Uh, I have two different variations. I have this right here, which is Google Earth, and I have Navionics. Navionics basically sucks, but it has a few contours right in here for us. So you have a nine to five job. You hate your wife and kids. You want to get away for a while to go fishing. <laughs> and so he pulls up this map and he's looking around and he says like, Jeff, where are the smallmouth spawning on the Shenandoah? Please help me out here. Where are they spawning? Pull it up. Make it make it um, a little bit more. Um... You want just the Google Earth? Um, yeah, Google Earth. It's going to be more detailed than uh, than the other one. Okay, here you go. Zoom in more. Keep zooming. Oh, man, he's going way in there. Okay. Because I don't see anything yet. All right, now let's start working up the work up the river somewhere. Those rocks right there, if the water's low enough, see in the middle right there? So they would literally Ledge. spawn right behind rocks. Yeah. They could. Really? I didn't know that. They could. Oh, and go um go 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 back up the other way. See right there above on the right hand side. Go all the way to the shoreline and start working up up river. The other way. This way down downstream. Yep. See right there. See that whatever that is. See that debris? On the right-hand side, go a little bit further up. Well, uh, right, right here, this. Nope, keep going to the left. Okay, on this bank. Yep, keep going up the bank. Nope, the other way. That's down. <laughs> okay, yeah, go down. Okay, the river's <laughs> going down that way. Okay, keep going. See that right there? This right here. Those that white water, see those, uh, see that white water, yeah. the ripples, something like that. Yeah. By just a map, by just looking at a map, I'm guessing. So, where in general, I always thought smallmouth want to like spawn in, in deep slack water, but they'll just spawn behind breaks, basically. Mm -hmm. I didn't know water that. could be uh, three feet deep. How much depth do they want? Three feet? Probably about that. It's probably a uh, um, minimum. Three, two and a half, three feet. Uh, hmm. They're going to get into water deep enough so that I imagine, I mean, keep in mind that they're, they're, they are just fish, but they're going to, they're going to spawn somewhere where even if the water gets real low, they still have enough water to spawn in. You know what I'm, you know what I mean? So here's a nice little thing right here I found. Yeah, an area like that, if it's a, uh, um, yeah, if it's deep enough on on the back side of it, down river side of it. And if this was, let's say, this was a big seam right here, because uh, uh, you see this little bit of white right here. Yeah. If this was a big seam, would they try to build their nest dead center of the seam, or will they build it towards the edge of the current? No, they're going to be in the uh, in the slack water with their uh, beds. Okay. And then they can now, pull, they can push out into the current and eat and come back. With spawning smallmouth, how, assuming you can't visually see them on the bed, how long are you giving an area this time of year versus earlier in the spring when they're very aggressive? <clears throat> um, so you pull up on a spot that you've never been before, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 10 minutes. Okay. You know, maybe, maybe try something that, that moves through the, through the eddy first, like a spinner bait, crank bait. And then if that doesn't, if that, if a spinner bait or a crank bait doesn't work, you know, especially a spinner bait, if they don't hit the spinner bait, that doesn't mean there's not fish there. They could be on the bottom. I mean, they're always on the bottom, but they could just be watching that spinner bait go over their head and they're just not interested. 
Now you throw the plastic in there, they'll come over and eat it. I mean, I, I really believe that if a small mouth is in a hole, you know, in an eddy, and you throw a plastic bait in there, there's probably a 98% chance you just have to have terror. You just have to have a really bad day that day if they're not going to bite it. But 98% chance they just can't help themselves. They're going to come over and pull on it, eat it. Somehow, some way, you, you're going to, you know, you're either going to miss them when you go to set the hook or you're going to catch them. I agree with that. They're, they're just so, so aggressive. I, I, I agree with that. And I, I believe, and you probably see this with a lot of the anglers that you have on, on guided trips. You have one group of anglers that all they throw is plastics, and then you have the other group of anglers that all they do is throw moving baits. Mm. And again, I feel like you have to be in the middle as an angler. Don't go to the extremes because if you just throw the plastics, you're going to be efficient, but you're not going to cover as much water. If you just throw moving baits, you're going to miss a lot of fish. Yeah, you have to be real well, well-rounded. well You know? You do. You're 100% you be right. Real well, well-rounded. And... Uh, be confident with a couple moving baits, a couple plastics, uh, a couple top water. Um, you know, if you're going to seriously fish for smallmouth, get very familiar with jerk baits too. Are you still fishing a lot of jerk baits right now? Yeah, in certain areas, yeah. Is it is it depth dependent? Yeah, and water clarity. Ooh, that's a good one. I didn't even think of that. Do you have a problem with spinner baits and the fish biting the blades? Yeah. Um, you know what I'm noticing? Uh, the past few days I've noticed some of these fish are getting hooked under the chin, you know, underneath on the outside. And the mm -hmm. only thing I can think of is they're trying to grab the blades. You know, they're coming up and nailing the blade and hooking themselves. Oh, uh, okay. I think that's, I think that's what causes the, um, uh, when they get hooked under the chin, I'm pretty confident that that's what that's from. That sounds about right to me. I mean, cause and then, like, I, I think and then you'll, you, you'll see them when they grab, uh, when they, when you have one on and you're reeling them in and, um, you know, he's pulling drag and he's getting close to the boat and then your spinner bait just pops out of the water or comes back real fast. They probably just had a hold of the blades the entire time. I've seen them all the way up to the boat with the blades in their mouth and uh, then they just let go. That's crazy. Yeah. What color blades do you like to throw? Silver and gold. That's about it. What color skirt? Uh, green pumpkin. A black. Really? Yeah. Like any type of green pumpkin, a black, um, white, white and chartreuse and then um like anything that could pass for a uh bluegill purple with brown and maybe some gold colored um uh you know skirting in it hmm. or yellow mixed in with it like a peanut butter and jelly color okay yeah I, I just never would have thought of that. And it's black too. That's interesting. How did you figure that out? Well, just by throwing them. Well, there you go. I mean, just simple. I mean, just black. Oh, brown. I mean, I'm just giving you a bunch of a bunch of colors, but We're I don't think you can go wrong with these colors. Is it as much the colors of the skirt versus the blade? I feel like the blades. I think are the it's big the blades, deal. and I think it's whenever I think it. Um, um, there's a lot, it has a lot to do with also, uh, the clarity of the water. If the water's, if the water's clearer than it is, um, if it's, if it's more, if it's clearer than dirtier, you know, if, it, if it's a lot more clear than dirty, I'll throw and the water's high, I'll throw willow leaf blades. If it's, um, uh, heavily stained and there's visibility, like a foot or two of visibility, but you can't see the bottom of the river. In like three feet of water, I'll throw a Colorado bladed uh, spinner baits because they thump more. Hmm. Have you ever thrown an underspin? Yeah, I have. I I, I have. Um, owner used to make one, or maybe still does. And I used to put a four inch um, 
uh, Kitech on it and uh, throw it. It seemed to work pretty good. I just kind of gotten away from it, but it probably it would still work today. Yeah, I've just always curious about that because I, I remember the old timers talking about the spinner bait being so good. And it's like, well, if the conditions don't work for a spinner bait, is there another bladed type of bait that Yeah, that would bladed work? jig. Chatterbait, yeah. Chatterbait. Dude, I gotta I've get seen, better with that. I've seen them um where you'll throw you'll have a person throwing they're in, they're they're fishing the same exact piece of water, right? Um, a shoreline. And they're, they're keep throwing in the same spot in the same spot and the chatterbait will, will catch the fish and the spinnerbait won't really. Mm -hmm. Yep. How, I, I guess if you knew, if anyone knew this information, you'd be a billionaire. How do you know when to throw what? Like, cause you only have two arms and you can only have one rod and reel in the water at a time. How do you know what to throw when? You know what I mean? Cause it's like and a fourth and sometimes it's just luck. You start yeah. throwing a spinner bait and you're not getting bit, you know? So then you start, then you, then you start having that, uh, rod and reel with the chatter bait and you keep going back and forth. And then hopefully you can, um, uh, realize that there's a pattern, you know? If you start catching them mm -hmm. or if you start getting strikes. Yeah. I think and that's I guess the only way. In your circumstance, do you ever have your, let's say you have two people out with you uh, at the same time. Do yeah. you give one a spinnerbait and one a chatterbait? Yeah. Now I, I, I know that they're going to, I'm not just giving it to them. We're not, we're not like, um, uh, I'm not doing any type of uh, guessing on it. I mean, I'm, I have a pretty strong um, feeling that one of those two baits are going to get bit. And maybe both of them will that day. And then there's no need to change. When are you going to get, when do you start throwing crankbaits? I've just, I've been throwing them now. I've, been getting, bit on, I've been getting bit on um, uh, bandit crankbaits. Two hundreds. <gasps> those are my favorite. The two hundreds, the ones that, that show four to eight feet, feet of water. And, um. Uh, they have, they have knockers in them, and I've been getting bit on uh, crawdad colors. What about the uh, – do you ever do, uh, is it, I guess, root beer? The yellow with a little bit of brown in it? I have that one too. Dude, that one is banging. I have something similar, similar to that, yeah. I got to send you a care package. I got a couple of really hot yellow ones that I painted. Uh, that chartreuse crankbait when the mu water gets muddy and you just start cranking as hard as you can, man. Oh, yeah. my God. That's fun. And then they hit that thing with hatred. And then I have, um, you know, I have a bunch of the KVD. I, I, I sell the bandits. I really like those. The, the smallmouth on the Potomac and, and the Susquehanna seem to really like that bandit crankbait. And, you know, mm -hmm. the crankbaits in general, I think is just a giant rabbit hole that you can go down because they all, they all, um, oh, they also, they, they like the DT uh, series uh, Rapala crankbaits too. But some days you, you could throw a KVD crankbait. Uh, Strike King, and they won't touch that, but they'll hit a bandit crankbait. And they're all moving different, you know? They all wiggle a little bit different. It, why is that? I mean, I, I just, because they're they're just made of different blanks and stuff. There's diff it. different, um, their blanks have different bodies. Uh, and then I have Lucky Craft ones, too, and that they seem to work real well, too. But the... Well, uh, but I feel confident in telling people that the bandit crankbaits are working real well. Well, um, I think this would be a great time if you wanted to go into your bait shop. This guy basically has a Bass Pro Shop behind him, everyone. Uh, if you want to grab a couple of baits that you like right now, including some of his crankbaits, let's show them off. Yeah, let me let me get the um, the two bandit crankbaits. And I'll show you another type, uh, another color crankbait. This is a this is a 1.0 KVD that's been working. Let me grab them. All right, guys. And then so let me show you off some of the things that are in his. But while he's gone, I'm going to show off to the public uh, Shallow Water Fishing Adventures website here. Uh, show you some of the baits that he actually has. Uh, this is the Bandit. This is the 200 series that he's been talking about. Oh, oh my gosh, guys. He has my favorite color. All right. So this one, this baby right here, <clears throat> this one has won me some money. 
I don't know what the name of this color is. Uh, I think it's sexy root beer that makes money. Um, but that color right there is banging. <laughs> they, um, sure. I also have, uh, yeah, that, that one I was getting ready to, sh Oh, is that the one? No, no, I have that one there, but I was going to show you the, the, the two or the three that have been working. The floor is yours, sir. Here's the first one up. Oh, come on, camera. See this one right here? That's a good day. You, you can get that on camera pretty good. Ooh, that's See that color nice. right there. It's an orange. The, the orange is a little bit deeper than what it's showing on my uh, on my screen. And then it goes into a um, a brown brown back. And this one is called uh, brown. What is that right there? <clears throat> I mean, I have your website up so I can find the color. Right yeah, just here. find the co color. Oh, brown crawl orange belly. That that's what it's just telling me. Yeah, we got chartreuse. We got a chartreuse black back scale, and then we also have. And oh, here's the number for it. So the bandits give you like a like a a model number. This one right here I just showed you is called BDT two hundred four. And it should be on my uh, website too when you go and look at them. Your website's up right now. Yeah. So here is the two hundred series. We There's that. The that group. one. Um. That was. That was a good. That's a good one. Oh, go to the next one. That one right there. I was catching fish on today too. Look at the depth of that red. Oof. Yeah. And I love the action of the bandits. I really do. Now keep in mind these are these are two hundreds. They're going four to eight feet. So you want to be careful when you're throwing them out here. You want to have somewhere where you're going from shallow down to about four or five feet. We've got the other colors here. And we got... There the, it is right uh, there. That's the color. And that is the... Yep. Yep. Okay, so guys, <clears throat> just to make sure we have confirmation. So this right here, if you if you search it up, is brown crawled at orange belly, BDT204. Uh, <clears throat> That's a beautiful color there. I really like that color, actually. Oof. And then go up, um, go up to the top of the page. You'll see the you'll see a picture of a, or I mean, back to the uh, crankbait like page right itself. Okay. See that? See that bait? That's right there. The big one in the in the um in the picture up top. Scroll up. See that crankbait right there? Yeah. That one's called a um, a phantom watermelon red crawl. Um, they're hitting that one too. Is that a strike king? Yep. And that that's in a one hundred series. So that one. <clears throat> That one's not going to go uh, super deep. That one goes to about three feet. Fire crawl. Okay. <clears throat> Phantom watermelon. That is such a weird. Who the hell? Someone had to have been doing acid when they came out with Phantom watermelon. It's a That's cool such looking a bait, especially when you um, pull it That's up cool. in pictures. Dude, it's cool as shit. I wonder if they still make it. I really got to buy this. I do not like it that Google has my information. That's scary. Um, damn, that's a cool color. And, and the other thing is, too, guys, I will say this. A side note. If you're fishing the tidal Potomac River, I just had a tournament two weeks ago now on the tidal, and there was a little bait in these little holes on these grass flats. And the only thing that could match the hatch was actually a strike King 1.0 silent crankbait and the bandit 200 series. And that's and what so these that's are. Like, these are silent. These are KVD. I have all mm -hmm. silent KVD crankbaits. So these baits that we're <clears> showing <throat> you also work on the tidal Potomac, not just for smallmouth. So that, that's really cool. Um, now, and these, so crank, and and these crankbaits, these are situational baits, man. I mean, you can't just go out and expect to catch fish with these any time. You know, there's times where they're just not going to work. But right now when the water's, with the water up, when the water's higher than average and you've got some stain to it, um, it doesn't hurt to try to try and throw a crankbait, especially when the water is reaching 60 degrees and above 60. Especially once it gets to 60 degrees and it doesn't go back down. What, what is the difference in the conditions? And so you, you just highlighted the crankbait conditions. What are the chatterbait conditions? 
they're pretty much the same thing. But the thing with the chatterbait is you could throw it in, um, you know, you could throw it in real rough water, real, real swift water. And, uh, and, you know, produce a strike that way. The, but the chatterbait you have to be careful with because it'll snag. Once you throw it out there, you got to get it going quick. Yeah. And I still get my butt kicked in tournaments with this, but the thing about it with the chatterbait or the swim jig or something like that, or a, a spinnerbait, you have one hook. And unless the smallmouth gets it, you, they're going to come unbuttoned. The one thing I like about throwing a crankbait when I can get the crankbait bite mm -hmm. is I feel like with a smallmouth, sometimes I feel like a smallmouth. I don't know if this is true or not. I feel like sometimes they just hit a bait because they're mad at it and they don't even open their mouth. They just hit it. And with a crankbait, at least you have a treble hook so where you could still get them. Yeah, they swat it. Um, they'll swat it a uh, spinnerbait. You'll just yeah. see him come up and there's a flash. Almost like get away from me. Kind of yes. Deal. Yes. I don't know if, if, if it's a, um, if they're trying to eat it and they miss it or if they're just swiping at it to get it away from them because yeah. they're just annoyed by it. I don't know. But you see that with top water too, where sometimes you feel like when they, when they start getting on a top water bite, are they actually trying to eat it? Or are they just trying to kill it? I don't know. I mean, how does a, um, I was on the Susquehanna recently. This is a few days ago. I was using a um, Mega Bass um, 110 Junior, you know, and um, they have nine hooks on there, three treble hooks. Jesus. How in the hell does a uh, smallmouth hit that and come off? <laughs> a Houdini. Yeah. I mean, how in the world do they strike that thing and, uh, and not hook the hell out of their face? Take that bait and swat it with your hand and see what happens. Don't do it, but just imagine, <laughs> right? Somebody's listening, kid. It's like, I'm going to do it because Jeff said to, yeah, to no. swat this um, but, <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean it's, you know, it's kind of the same thing, right? Or take it and, and throw it at your um, hooded sweatshirt that's laying there um, or hanging up and see if it doesn't hook the hell out of your hooded sweatshirt. And you're like, how the hell am I going to get this out? I just wonder if it's because they're pushing so much water. And that's why it is. Probably. I don't know. I, like, it's just fascinating to me. Like you could talk about that. I could talk about that philosophy for six hours. I mean, I'm using uh, bigger, I'm using bigger crankbaits than this and catching smallmouth. Lucky craft cool. makes some pretty good crankbaits and they're, they're pretty fat. I gotta get that up now too. Two and a half, two, two and a, two and a half, two and three quarter inches big, but they're fat. Can you pull those up? Yeah, I'm looking for them right now. I've got a chartreuse colored one. Char yeah, chartreuse colored, a um, American shad colored one, and a crawdad color one. And you know the idea behind those fat crank baits too, uh, the fatter ones, is that they um, they're pushing water. Uh, they're silent, but they push water around. Fish can feel that. And sometimes if the uh, smallmouth are, um, I like that. Um, if they're just not really in the mood for one that's knocking, you know, a uh, crankbait that you're throwing it and they're just not hitting one that's making a rattling noise underwater, throw a silent one and see if it changes their mind. I think silent really does play a lot more nowadays with the fishing pressure. Like I, like in the past, I would say start with a different a regular crankbait, so to speak, and then switch to a silent. Now I believe it's like, heck, just start with a silent one. I mean, that one right there is a more of a higher end. That was their answer to balsa wood, but it's a plastic body, mm -hmm. but it, it fishes like a balsa wood uh, type uh, crankbait wood. Explain to everyone at home, like why balsa wood? Because of the way it floats. And it, um, how it moves through the water. It has a real, um, real good wobble, you know, but I've caught them on those. And the one thing guys, I would say, this is kind of down a rabbit hole. This is just, this is me personally, um, switch the treble hooks out to triple grips, um, you don't have to. I just personally believe it's a really good thing to hey, do. I think that thing. these bandits already come with triple grip hooks. They're a lot more um, meaner looking than the uh, 
KBD ones. I can tell you that. No, they're they're they're. Uh, Bandit has some pretty good hooks, but um, because what'll happen is if you fish this stuff around a lot of rock, mm -hmm. over time the hooks are going to wear out mm -hmm. uh, from banging into stuff. So I always say like, because like I know a lot of guys they'll they'll pull out a crankbait they've been fishing for six years and the hooks are dull. So just be very mindful of your treble hooks because you need that sticky sharpness on that because a lot of times you're just going to like just gum the small mouth or the large mouth. So just be mindful that your hooks stay sharp. Now, what else do you like to throw this time of year? Um, that's pretty much it, man. You know, the, where the, for the moving baits, the spinner bait, the chatter bait, um, these crank baits, and the tickler. Yeah, the now the tickler. I started using it last year. Um, I think it was in the fall, and then really? it worked all the way through the winter. Yeah, that's when I found out about it. Um. The Ned rig's always a winner. I'll, I'll tell you another one too, because the water's warming up. Is a uh, wacky rig. Ooh. Especially when the water starts, um, if it starts falling and starts getting real clear, just throw a um, a wacky rig. Hmm. Maybe a weightless one, or one with a real lightweight on it. What type? Um, bait. Just any type of cinco type bait, four inch or five inch. They'll hit a five inch one too. Yeah, I've always find it fascinating that everyone has their own worm that they like. So I always have to ask, like, oh yeah, what's oh, your well, favorite? Oh well, the one, worm? the ones I like use. I I pour them. I can pour the four inch ones. Um, but uh, in a pinch, I'll use the yum, yum dingers. Mm, okay. They're not bad. They catch. <laughs> they they catch fish. Yeah, I've always been curious, like. Is there actually a difference in the worms or are all worms the same? Oh, like, and another one, know. another, another brand I like using, and I have these right now for sale is, um, I wanted to try them as well. Are the, uh, Z man zingers, the five inch ones. Z man zingers. That is a heck of a name. Yeah. They're, they're five inch Cinco's basically, but in a Laztec and they, uh, they work pretty good. That's freaking cool. Especially you, throwing you them on like a three odd hook. Um, weightless, they work. They work very well. Do you have some? Yeah, <laughs> let me let me show you. Actually, I have one rigged up. And this is why, guys, you make sure the guys that you talk to have a tackle shop right behind them. It's this bait right here. This one's a little ugly though, because it's been getting used. Not ugly. It looks beautiful. It's got battle scars. That's what we call that. Yeah, but then I and I have that three odd hook on it. If, if this was four inches, I'd use a two-odd hook. Mm. But yeah. And I guess you could go up to bigger than a three-odd if you wanted maybe to put a little bit more weight on it so you could get out even further. Dude, that thing looks so good, though. But yeah, just like this, and you throw it out, and it's just, and it it's going to um, hit the water and just kind of ever so slowly fall. And then you pull up on it a little bit, and it'll it'll come back up. And it'll fall again. And uh, man, these things are super, super hard to get hung up. So you can just you can just with confidence throw them into all kinds of crap. I've always been curious, like when you're throwing that, are, are you trying to add action to it, or do you no. just like dead stick it? No, I mean you're just throwing it out. Let it go to let it sink, uh, and try to figure out how long it takes. You know, um, you know when you get your first bite, try to remember what you've been doing. But throw it out. Let the current, you know, uh, whatever current is in the eddy, if the if the eddy's swirling around or something like that, or if it's near a seam, let the river do most of the work, and then uh, every so often pull up on it a little bit and let it fall back down. Okay. But you want to you want to make sure with this bait. You want to make sure you have some type of um, control on your line because you're, you're throwing it and you're letting it go slack. So you, mm -hmm. want to, you want to try to keep your line as tight as possible without moving this bait so that when you feel that hit, because sometimes they'll, they'll swim off with it and just tighten the line up, or, or your line will just start going to the left or right, or you'll feel them tap it. And you need to pull back and set the hook. And if you have too much slack, you'll miss them. 
What do you think about the guys that use really bright colored braided line to a leader? That way it, they have better um, bite detection. Oh, that, that that would work great. I don't see anything wrong with it, especially if you make um, – uh, the only time I could see maybe there's some, possibly something wrong with it is if their leader is too short and the water's super clear. Okay. But – if you have like a rod's length, seven foot, six and a half, seven foot of uh, leader line, like fluorocarbon, yeah, I, I don't think that interferes with anything. Yeah, I always curious. I want to make sure I got I got your 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 thoughts on that because yeah, I know people, a lot of people anglers. like that. I I just use green a uh, green color, but um, some people swear by the uh, yellow high vis stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing like wrong with that. Too. Nothing wrong with it at all. Well, dude, like I mean. What what else have we not covered uh, tonight? You know, it's it, Memorial Day is coming up. People are going to start getting out with the family. Uh, any other advice that you have for anglers and families going out on the water this 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 late spring into summer? Well, late spring and early summer, start trying to throw um, sinkos, four inch and three inch sinkos, on some type of um, uh, weedless jig head, like a Charlie Brewer slider head. Okay, and um, you know, throw it out, let the current do its thing, and uh, wait for a bite. There you have it, guys. I mean, the it's man. pretty much that simple. And maybe that's the problem is we make it too complicated. But um, other than that, I mean, you know, uh, starting in late May, early June, you know, start thinking about where these fish might go after they spawn. They'll push out into the middle of the river somewhere. If you can find ledges and stuff like that out in the river or um, rock that always stays some, it might not be a, a, a ledge, but large rocks that just always stay submerged. They'll push out there to, to feed up after they they've spawned. But don't worry guys, because when that transition happens, uh, Jeff will be back on the show and yeah. maybe we'll have his pimped out studio done by then. And we'll do a live stream. So all of his fans and, and admirers can uh, get autographs and ask you questions. What we should do is a, um, is a podcast on the river. Yeah, that'd be good. We might not have self service. So just be two guys talking to each other, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. <laughs> have, uh, have your uh, camera out there and doing a podcast. Dude, that'd be funny. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Put a cell tower in the back of the boat. Yeah. You get, um, <laughs> we could, we could show throwing this in, uh, real shallow water. What it'll do in real, in real time. Yeah. Jeff, Great. where can people follow you? Is there anything else that uh, you want to add to the people at home? Um, no, they, they can follow me on, uh, Facebook, Instagram, check out my, uh, my boat, both my websites, my guide service website and my, uh, uh, my tackle shop, SWFA baits. Um, I mean, all the stuff I have in that website, the tackle shop I use. And, uh, if you, know, if you want to, want to be able to buy something and buy it the first time and be right, I have those baits and those lures. So you can feel confident in using them, but you have to remember all these baits, they're like tools. You can only use them in certain situations. Mm-hmm. They're all situational, you know. Um, Don't get married to one thing. No, no. You try to try try to be um, pretty proficient with at least one type of plastic bait, one moving bait, you know, and maybe some top water. You know, the top water bite should start happening pretty good in uh, in June. And like always, guys, link in the episode just uh, link in the episode description to everything we just talked about today, and including go sign up, go book this guy out. Okay, he's sad. He wants more of you guys to visit him. Oh, and also, you guys all are coming. Hey, check out my um, check out my my little YouTube channel that I have going. I have about oh, fifty four right. videos right now. They're short. If you don't have uh, um patience for a long video, man, I do these videos. They're like three minutes, six minutes long. And they talk, you know, some of them I'm fishing in, um, talking about how I've been catching fish and talking about my, uh, what I have on my, uh, in my tackle shop. So they're basically like three, three minute commercials. 
There they are. Dude, he's got a drone footage for his video. Look at this, guys. Takes it to the next level, man. I, oh, I have I have some videos too, some how-to videos. They're not real in depth, but they're videos on installing like um uh aerator pumps. Um I talk about how I installed that washdown pump for my jet boat. That's probably the last video that's on there. Yeah. That one right there. Oh, you got shorts too? Man, yeah, I got all kinds punch. of shorts. It's funny which ones. Um, I have one in there that has like 5,000 hits on it, and it's of a, um, a squirrel swimming across the river. Who knew? You see the squirrel? <laughs> there he is. Don't you just love it that you put so much time into like some other of these videos? You put hours and no one cares. You video a damn rat swimming across the thing and it just shoots. It's just Oh, I have another one of two um I think I think they're two they're two snapping turtles. I don't know if they're getting ready to um if it's Get a it mating on. season, mating ritual, or if they just don't like each other and they're fighting in the water. But that one has like five or four thousand hits. Then they're okay. just rolling around in the water. Can you pull that one up real quick for people? Yeah, hopefully it's not too net geographic. Let's see. I've seen this more than once. Look, one's like trying to drown the other one. Yeah, it's either drowning or we're watching some uh, HBO After Dark. Yeah, that yeah, one got like 4,000 hits, I think. Yeah, this looks like some weird Cinemax stuff. I mean, I went mm -hmm. over. I, I at one point in time, I I went over a little bit uh, closer to him and tapped him on the uh, shell with my rod tip. They didn't even care. Yeah, when you're in the mood, you're in the mood. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, it, it's funny what some people or what a lot of people like, and then, like you said, you could put time into something, and um. You think it looks pretty good, and you don't get very many hits on it. <laughs> Welcome to YouTube, my brother. Yeah. <laughs> That's it's, how it goes. It, it's fun to put them out there. No, it, it is fun. It is fun, and, and it's good for you to diversify your portfolio. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, um, I think people like watching the videos. That no, do, they do. Uh, they they do, do fish with me. You just got to keep cranking them out. Yep. All right, link in the episode description, everything we talked about today, guys. And please like like, and subscribe to me on Facebook. There's 30% of you that are watching all these videos that aren't subscribed yet. What are you doing? Please, we are the fastest growing outdoor and fishing show in the greater DMV metropolitan area. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.